I'm uh, recording is in progress. Thanks for having me guys. And uh, I uh, really am a victim uh, of a childhood where I was surrounded by radio. The nice looking girl next door's dad was a ham. Cousin was the radio TV repairman. Shop teacher was a fanatical antique radio restorer. So no matter where I looked as a kid, I didn't stand a chance. I was going to probably get into RF or radio or something. So um, as far as forwarding the video, um, I'm just going to say something like next. I'll just drive it to the next. That's, so can you guys see? It's a little, yeah, that one is, is oh, okay. okay, so anyway, um, the shortwave listener dreamer, okay, and by dreamer, I mean, have you seen some of the uh, prices of what radio parts and radios in, in general cost in the early 60s and into the 70s. And we see a price like $39.95 for a receiver and we think, wow, that's cheap. But when you translate the $39.95 into $20, $22, you find out that how am I gonna come up with that $200 on my paper route, right? Okay? So the first thing is, you can't have it and you see it. You want it so bad. You're willing to do anything to get your hands on that shiny receiver because you want to hear what's going on out there in the world with your shortwave. Let's go to the next one. Yep. Yeah, so I'm not blocking the, the thing completely. Okay, he's fine. So. You guys heard I have a YouTube channel, Microwave One with a K. Um, the story on that is simple. I found myself in Dana Farber, 45 years old, two kids at home, and I had two weeks to live. But you know what? Those guys fixed me leukemia. And I came out the other side. And things you think about, you know, you know, they talk about when you have a near-death experience that that's when you change. You do change. All of your bad habits get amplified. <laughs> if you were bad before, after you survive something like that, you are absolutely ravenous to do more of it. And that's what happened to me. And I'm trying to think, how am I going to pass on all of this energy about being a ham radio kid being a shortwave listener kid. And uh, I thought, well, maybe I should write some articles or maybe I should do a book or a picture book for kids like my favorite book here, and I'm gonna hold it up. My favorite book is Alfred Morgan's Boy's First Book of Radio and Electronics. This is the one that got me started. And a lot of the people in here probably too. So this new thing had just come out called YouTube. So I decided to get on board early. And I started to record some videos, very primitive at first, building simple kids projects and so on. So that's OK. So anyway, uh, I also have a Facebook page that supports the YouTube channel. Because when you do a YouTube video, everybody complains. That schematic went by in 30 seconds. I didn't have time to do anything with it. So I have a Facebook page that gives you the high resolution schematics, high resolution plans, parts list, and you can study them and download them all day. So my interests are kids radio projects, surplus use and converting old surplus junk, history, classic radio repair, uh, retro QRP, I invented that term. If you ever hear the term retro QRP, 
That's me. Retro QRP is where you're using a one transistor, a one tube transmitter with a crystal and you're making a receiver out of a direct conversion transistor or something. Anyway, it's retro. And then uh, antique radio uh, CW contest. Okay, next one. We've got to go a little faster. Uh, after World War II, uh, all of the surplus became available. And many of us had these radios because they were either pass downs or they were found on Radio Row or downtown Boston at Meshna or something like that, right? So there was no need for a dream receiver because there was so much of this hardware and surplus out there. All you need to do is grab a BC-348 and that was a pretty good novice receiver. Keep going. So a typical 1950s novice station might be an ARC-5 and a BC-348. That's a pretty nice station. It would be hard to beat that station if you had to pay for it in the real government dollars. Okay, let's, uh, uh, the, the BC-348 does tune pretty fast. You've seen the dial on it, right? There's a little movie in the next one. Let's run this little movie right here. Now the question is, is the World War II BC-348 a better CW receiver than yours. We're on 40 meters. This is the crystal filter out and the crystal filter in. Okay, so why would you ever go out and buy something commercial when you've got a receiver like that for 49 bucks that you can pick up downtown? Here's the BC-652. Unfortunately, I didn't get one of those. The guy dropped this tank receiver off. This is my, this is how I was supposed to learn CW on this thing. Okay, next. Run this little. So we're looking at a receiver. This is the receiver that was dropped off to me. And uh, this was my first receiver that I practiced code with, the BC-652 tank receiver. So it, I'm going to take it up to the novice band. I'm going to go up here. Now, one of the problems with a receiver like this is if you're looking at the, at the dial, you can see we're at 3.7. Novices were only allowed to go from 3.7 to 3.75. So from there to there. Bang. From here to there. Just about two turns of the knob and you're out of the novice band. So not a great idea. <laughs> To have to use this thing on the air, but boy, I did. So the other thing that kind of got spun up at this time was homebrew. Let's build our own radio, right? We're going to make our own radio. And uh, the first one I tried to make was the one right out of the Morgan book. And it's the, uh, the one tube regen. So this was kind of a dream receiver for me to try to get that to work. Now, it's not like I got it to work, but I tried. And I remember my father going down with me to the TV repair shop to get this 6BF6 tube. And the guy gouged us like $7.95 for this tube in 1970 or something. It was just, he had us, you know, so had to have that exact tube, right? Okay, so in this video, I'm going to avoid toy receivers, portables like this beautiful Zenith Transoceanic. I'm gonna avoid the kind of radios you'd find in a European yacht, okay? Uh, Space Patrol and fan, I'm gonna avoid all that. I'm gonna avoid big boat anchors and surplus. We're gonna concentrate on those years that you might find in that allied catalog the 1963 Allied catalog, you'd find and uh, you'd ruling over. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. Okay, let's get started. So after the Cold War got really rolling, shortwave stations around the world started to spring up. And there was always shortwave stations, you know, during the 20th century. But boy, during the Cold War, you had all kinds of interesting things happening. I mean, I was getting QSL cards from 
Radio China and Moscow is getting magazines from every communist country in the world. They sure liked me. <laughs> so I'd bring all this stuff into school and they thought I was some kind of a young communist or something in upstate New York. Thank God we've got a fallout shelter. You know, these kids are, they're raising in town. Anyway, here's the, uh, the box, okay, that came out of that. It's the Halicrafters S38 line. These have been known to uh, really excite a lot of young amateurs when they touch this and ground and they have the plug and it's very exciting. So yeah. this is a good training aid for novices at the time. Okay, next one. Okay, here's the ultimate, the S38E. Look at the dial. I mean, isn't this what you'd like to have right here? Something like that? Again, ACDC, do not take a bath with this. Okay, next. So here's another fun project. It's called the Knight Ocean Hopper. This, this allied Knight company, they come up with this beautiful kit, the Ocean Hopper, 1595. Now, a boy pumping gas or a paper route or mowing lawns or doing whatever kids did to be able to get this thing. That's a goal. You could get that. And you could probably find an Elmer or a ham to help you assemble it and you'd be on the air. So here's a picture of a couple of kids with their ocean hopper. It's a beautiful thing. Okay, next. Uh, this night space spanner. Anybody ever operated one of these? This is a regen. This thing's actually stable enough. You can use it on 80 and 40. And uh, my friend Dwayne had one of these. That was his first radio. I had the tank receiver and he had this. Okay, let's go, let's go on. Uh, regens, regens, the Explore Air. Okay, this is an exciting regenerative receiver. Uh, ACDC kit. Uh, you can tune in the world for $21, and it's made in the USA. Uh, Heathkit came in with a regen with the stupidest front panel I've ever seen, this dial that goes around the world. Uh, anybody do Graymark kits in school? You guys ever hear of Graymark? It was a kit company, and the uh, shop teachers around the country would offer these to the kids as kits. We had them in the, in the 70s. And I did a wireless broadcaster. Some of the kids did receivers. They had garage door, remote control stuff, all kinds of crazy stuff. Okay, next. Ah, the, the ultimate regen, the Knight Span Master. Uh, this is uh, almost $25. And uh, this is kind of the last of the regens and uh, we're gonna get into some super heads now. So here's one that you guys should be familiar with. The Holocrafters S120. Anybody remember this rig? Oh yeah. That's a, it's a pretty popular radio, right? And the reason I have Jeannie in here is because this was a dream receiver, right? For many of us. This, this one people know about. Um, I've restored a couple of these. Um, Again, it's an ACDC set. So if you're not careful, you're gonna get a little tickle off it. Nobody's had that happen, right? Okay, let's keep going. We're still under hundred bucks. Here it is, the Night Star Roamer. Imagine somebody coming up with an idea where you take an All-American five and maybe replace one tube with a diode. So it's only four tubes. And then you just put a bunch of coils in there and you call it a shortwave receiver. It's a great idea. It's not super sensitive, but it keeps the price down to $39.95. And what a sharp front panel. And more knobs has got to be better. Any kid, <laughs> I'm going to pay dollars per knob, okay? And I'm getting more knobs per dollar here than on those regents. So this has got to be a better receiver. Okay, next. So the Star is a dream receiver. This is another one that would have been very popular. Uh, as a first entry level type receiver. Uh, Heathkit was watching all of this and they said, man, we need to get into this entry level shortwave stuff. We can't be left behind, we are the kit people. So they started to, to do uh, kits. 
And uh, they came out with a whole bunch of interesting kits. Are any of these familiar to anyone in the room? These, these Heath kits, right? Absolutely, right? Wow. 8495, that's getting up there. Yeah, uh, it's, it, well, it's got more knobs. So. <laughs> <laughs> any idea what's in place and what 8495 is? Yeah, it's, 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 by the time they got to this, it's probably like 67. Okay. So. But I can just skip. It's about a factor of 10. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yep. Let's keep going here. So the, the, uh, wow. the 54 here, and here, here we are, okay? And this is exactly what you guys were saying, okay? I looked it, I looked it up. The one you asked about, I looked up. Wouldn't you know that? So there's an unbuilt GR54 kit on eBay for $709 last year. And adjusted for inflation, 90 bucks is $774. So you say, why aren't people making kits anymore? Do you know how expensive it is to make kits? and to source the parts and to support getting those kits out. If you would like to have a simple beginner's receiver like this and you have $700, I would like to get into the kit business. <laughs> but you're not gonna get it for the, uh, the dongle price of 39.95, okay, that you're getting with your little SDRs. Okay, here's one. The ICO 711 Space Ranger. Anybody ever heard of the ICO? This guy's claim to fame was you can build it because everything's on one little board. So this was the easiest receiver to build of everything we've seen so far. Um, it was one that probably you had a better chance of getting done in, you know, a couple months rather than a year, you know, for some of these. Okay. $49.95 kit, not bad. And here's the layout. So everything's on one board. Again, many of these were simple all-American fives repackaged. So just four tubes and a rectifier dive. And that makes a receiver. I can't imagine the performance was very good with this. Okay, next. Uh, now, if you are a shortwave listening purist, why would you ever need a BFO? You're just listening to overseas shortwave, right? You don't need a BFO. So uh, this radio here dispenses with the VFO. This is XYL friendly. It can go in the kitchen. It looks like it, a nice, nicely appointed receiver that you could have in the, in the living room without too much, because I just like listening to shortwave. I plug in my, my COS headphones and I can listen to shortwave while she's knitting or whatever. And uh, that's what this is all about. There's another one coming up too. This Holocrafter, same thing. Wood grain paneling, you know, this is something for the living room. It's not for the ham shack. Uh, again, AM only. So here's some real uh, receivers that you could use for shortwave or for novice. The Knight R55 and R100 are both good receivers, decently built, and uh, they're not gonna give you a shock. They have a real transformer in them. But another pretty popular one, the Lafayette HE30. And guess what? You're getting all of these knobs. <laughs> and how did the Japanese do it? You're getting more knobs, for lower, lower price. Um, turns out this is the first import of the Japanese builds, okay? Trio would become a company called Kenwood. You might've heard of Kenwood. Okay. So here's the kid with his 
89.50 or 74.50 as a kit. And he's tuning his HG50. Once the imports arrived at the less cost than uh, we were getting for the, uh, for the big American radios, um, they became very popular and Lafayette was really pushing it. Uh, they were really pushing the imports and uh, pretty much would dominate the rest of the 60s, uh, the Japanese imports. And very shortly, they would start to get into the ham radio business as well, as we would find out. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, this is the 700. This is the one that I just restored. Um, the other thing, uh, these Japanese companies would relabel the radios. So it would have different model numbers. They would, you know, Allied might get a certain number. Uh, you know, Radio Shack, Lafayette, whatever radio company wanted to rebrand them, they would build to order. So here's the, uh, the 700. And I think I have a little movie of it coming up next. That's putting out about uh, 25 watts into a uh, Kenwood TL922 Alpha. Okay, very good. Very good. Yeah, and the antenna? What are you using for an antenna? Uh, homemade uh, dipole for uh, 80 meters. All righty. That's very nice. Very nice. Yeah, well, I have... Yeah, a non-resident. Yeah, well, I have... And uh, we're going to have a music view. Let's look at its uh, single signal selectivity for CW. Going through zero B. Not quite. Okay, so I'm biasing a little higher in frequency and lower sideband. Basically, I move the filter over a little bit. That's not perfect single signal selectivity, but for a novice, this would have been a good receiver. This is doing very well on 40 meters. Uh, demonstrating the AM automatic noise limiter. See, it does not affect the signal too much. Okay, here we are up on 15 meters. Oh, it's having some problems. Okay, so you got to see some of the fun that you have restoring these receivers. <laughs> so uh, National wants to get in the game and uh, they came up with their early thrill box, uh, something under a uh, hundred dollars for the novice. And uh, they have a little higher one here, but you can tell they're styling towards the sixties here, getting away from the, the big brick type receivers that National was known for and going for a little lower market. Uh, with this stuff. So this is the first generation solid state uh, from Heathkit, and this goes way back. All germanium transistor, portable, okay? Very exciting that you can run something on flashlight batteries. And uh, the Mohican uh, has bright, shiny knobs. Uh, that, that was Heathkit's uh, first uh, solid state, way back. Go ahead. Um, I did want to show at least one British radio, Eddie Stone. Uh, this was an entry level eight valve radio. It has an RF stage, so it's a little bit better than the ones we've been looking at so far, but what a gorgeous layout. 
Uh, they seem to like gray and white, black and white. Uh, they're not as colorful. This would not attract an American kid. It's too plain, but it's fine for the British. Okay. Now here's what we like, cosmic blue. And look at all the colors on this thing. This is, this is the ultimate, the NC-190 general coverage receiver. Fantastic. It's also got that national knob right between the two larger ones, the, the, the arrow. Yeah. And it looks wrong here, but that's fine. It's, these little switches probably get dirty. Okay, here's a real receiver. The SX-110, okay? Related to the one that we have on the bench over here that was brought in. Yeah. Yep, that's a one ten. Very nice. Okay. So at some point there was going to be a Japanese invasion. And it started, believe it or not, with Ico. Ico brought the first radios in from General Research Electronics in Japan, GRE. And GRE went full blast. And uh, we can look at some of the series. We'll go to the next receiver. This is the DX120, realistic. Again, GRE Japan, design and manufacture. Uh, the DX150, this was my dream receiver. I finally got one of these, 1971. Fantastic receiver. Um, my uncle took me on a road trip, my cousin and I, kind of a coming of age road trip to Alaska. And we went across Canada and I had this hooked up to the DC in his Winnebago and was copying Russians from Vladivostok up in Alaska with this thing. It was, it was a, a real fantastic, uh, but again, all coming in from Japan at the time. Uh, Lafayette, not to be outdone. More dial is better, bigger dial, okay? And uh, they got the, uh, the trio company, which would become Kenwood to do a similar uh, competitive receiver in the HA. Uh, 600, 800, 850, 820, whatever. They had a million different model numbers of this one. Anybody ever seen one of these before? That's kind of, it's like the size of a big toaster oven. Okay. So I think we're out of the, the paper route lawnmower and we're into our first real job. Okay, we're in college and we got our first real job we're able, we have a bank account. We're able to put money away toward our radio equipment. So we're gonna get above $200. And the first one that, this was extremely popular in Europe, the Trio. This is a nice uh, shortwave receiver. It's eight tubes, has an RF stage, but it's single conversion. You see, you see these all over the shacks in Europe. I don't see too many of them over here. So it's 525 Deutschmarks, okay? And uh, that would be uh, a lot of money in 68 probably, okay? So here is a very late contender, the Heath SB310, which is similar to the, uh, the ham radio receivers that uh, in the S line, that, that uh, SB line that Heathkit did. It was very little change to make a general coverage receiver with the linear master oscillator and tuning in bands similar to Collins, which is why they called this the poor man's Collins. This is probably the finest receiver uh, that Allied ever put out. It's a solid state receiver called the 190. Um, later on when they merged with Radio Shack, Radio Shack had those and you saw them and you said, wow, that's a beautiful looking receiver, but it's way too expensive. These are still quite collectible. The HQ100, 100A, this is the low end of Hammerland, but it's still pretty expensive. In the late 60s. We had mine. No, mine were. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah. And 
course, you know, that came out in 58, I think it says there. I had a 100A that I bought in 1968. Ah. And it cost me $80. Okay. So. Okay, so it works both ways. <laughs> okay. 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 If you really got some extra pocket change, how about the Drake? Now this is this is Drake's attempt at solid state. This is a short wave receiver that tunes in one megahertz bands, just like a Collins, and it has a strong front end, but it's solid state. These are fairly rare. These SPR fours. So here's a real receiver. Uh, the 122, um, this is a very high performance Holocrafters and uh, it was available fairly, fairly early, 62, yeah. 64, and then the A in 67. These are high priced radios. And then finally, uh, this SX-133, which is, I've never seen one of these, but it sure is sexy looking. So here's a real receiver, the HQ-180. And it's got as many tubes as it's got knobs. Okay, so this is a real receiver here. And uh, when tuned up properly, it can give a real run against some of the finest receivers in the world. Wow, that's a good point. Yep. They all seem to have it. Yep, good point. Triple conversion, HQ 180. Okay, has anybody ever seen one of these in the flash? Anybody know what that is? This is the HRO 500, which was. This is a PLL uh, type receiver made by National right down in Melrose. And they were trying to sell them to the government for 2,500 bucks each. That's, that's pretty amazing, huh? <laughs> so then Popular Electronics comes out with an article, is the HRO 500 the greatest receiver ever made? Well, I don't know, but uh, right now, if you pick one up, you're gonna to have to do a little work on it because it's all germanium transistors and everything is a little touchy in there, so. Okay, we're beyond the dreaming part now, aren't we? This is the fever dream, right? The 51S1 short wave, one megahertz bands, dual conversion when it's needed, triple conversion when it's needed, okay? We're not held back. And it doesn't need a lot of knobs because it just works. Okay. If your receiver works, you don't have to have a lot of knobs. Okay. This one works. Okay. Let's go. That was made until 1982. Really? Hard to believe, isn't it? That's quite a run. I guess Collins had something going, huh? So ah. this is just honorable mention because it's a little beyond the 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 era that I wanted to talk about, but if I didn't bring it up, somebody would complain because it's this Barlow Wadley loop. It's not a PLL, it's a fancy, okay, whatever. I'm gonna wave my arms and make it work. So this is a nice looking receiver. And this is Yesu, okay? Okay, just a few honorable mentions and then we'll close out. Super pros, right? Everybody should play with a Super Pro once. Okay, next one. How about these? It's a nice receiver. Those are fun. The R390A. I hate the receiver. I hate, I hate tuning it because it hurts my wrist. I hate adjusting it because there's a million adjustments. I hate lubricating it. I hate cleaning the relay contracts. I hate the way it burns up ballast tubes. I, I hate the audio. 
I hate the way the filters click. However, it's my main receiver. It's the only one I use. <laughs> so there, I, I said, said my piece. <laughs> The 390 is a better receiver. It doesn't rely on mechanical filters. It does all its filtering through LCs. And so it, it filters in stages rather than all at once in a mechanical filter, which tends to ring. So the R390A is the lower cost version of the R390. And it has fewer knobs, so it's not as good. So will it ever end? Uh, the, you can see here's all the nice catalogs and the, and the shortwave receivers are all sitting there. Will the obsession with the vintage shortwave end? I mean, we now have these SDRs coming from China that cost $39 or $49. Get a little converter in front of it and you can do shortwave. Uh, and dollars are not the same anymore. Uh, but there's still people that wanna keep collecting 50 or hundred of these. And then when their widow is left, what do they do? They come back, they come back into the market and you can recollect them again. So, so fi my, finally, I have to describe safety in the shack because we have to be safe. Um, this is actually me in the shack basement of WA1HUD Steve. Uh, lives down in Stoneham, Mass. And I, di I, I did that picture because I've never been in a three-dimensional maze of parts. <laughs> Everywhere you look, your hand goes up and you got to type 32. Hand, other hand goes up and you've caught something else. And it's just like every, you could hardly, it's beyond hoarding. So uh, I believe that is the last slide, so. Thank you for having me, guys, and I hope you enjoyed the uh, room this evening. Right. And, and Jim, can you hear me if I'm talking? Okay, so I will run this microphone around if anyone has a question. That way everybody can online can hear it. Anybody? Hold on, Bill. <laughs> when, you refer, when you refurbish these radios, what do you do about final tuning them up? Have you found documentation for, for these radios that tell you how to do the tune? So uh, the question is uh, about retuning radios and doing alignments in general, right? Almost all of the manuals and schematics and uh, alignment instructions are available on the BAMA website, the BAMA website. And you shouldn't have to pay for them. When you see ads, you know, to buy these manuals, you can buy those manuals, but you don't have to. Generally, you can get them free of charge on the internet. B-A-M-A. -A. And uh, if you just Google B-A-M-A, you'll find a repository for all of the manuals and all the schematics for all these old receivers. B-A-M-A stands for Boat Anchor Manual Archive. <laughs> Boat anchor, manual, archive. manual ar archive. There's thousands and thousands of hours of somebody sitting there with a scanner and scanning all of this stuff. And they're printing copies. Too. Yeah. You can print them out and work it. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah, Mike, you had a slide of the first Heath kit solid state radio here. The you Mohican. With the, uh, the Mohican with the yeah. germanium transistor. Yeah. Overall, the transition from tubes to transistors here would be an interesting overlay for the whole talk, right? And I imagine there was cost advantage with the tubes when that was a very mature industry, right? Compared to the early expensive transistors, but where did, was there a, kind of a 50% point where half the radios were solid state, half tubes? Well, the, the, the HRO 500 is a good example. It's a totally solid state radio, but it's built like a tube radio, okay? It's not how you would do things today. The Japanese uh, 
you can see when they started to build for this market, they were using circuit cards, but it was tubes on the circuit cards. When they transitioned to transistors, it didn't look that much different. They were able to use the same variable capacitors, same dials, same, you know, just a few parts changed uh, that were electronic, mm -hmm. but the cases and the knobs and everything else remained just about identical. So they were able to manage it much easier than the American companies who were very much tube and they found it much harder to transition into solid state. They weren't set up for it. And of course the Japanese went by them like a flash and suddenly the Collins that cost so much in the sixties, you were finding them in ham fests in the late eighties. And suddenly you could afford a Collins because the guy was looking at the whiz bang Kenwood and the whiz bang Yesu and ICOM. He didn't want that old Collins anymore. So now you could finally afford a Collins. <laughs> Just want to give a warning. Uh, if you get a tube radio and you don't know its history, don't plug it in <laughs> and turn the song knob on. You may have a fire. Uh, reason is the filter capacitors may be dried out, shorted. Uh, other capacitors inside, especially ones with wax on them or the black beauties, they call them, they tend to short out or leak. And if you turn the radio on, you could we see some destruction. So what you have to do is uh, invest in a, a variac. It's a variable transformer. And um, also uh, don't assume that the capacitors are good. Uh, if you have a Heathkit or a ICO capacitor checker, they're very, very handy to have. Uh, they allow you to step through the, the voltages until you get to the rating for the capacitor. And, and it's got a little, what do you call those tube that? Uh, eye. Magic, eye. magic eye. And you can quickly tell if it's a, a leaky capacitor or if it's, or you can rejuvenate it. You, you crank up the voltage very slowly and the eye starts to close when the capacitor starts to uh, rejuvenate. Then you step the voltage again, the eye opens and then it slowly closes. And if it's a bad capacitor, it never closes. So you toss it, go find another one. There are a couple of companies out there that will make the can capacitors. They still sell them. Basically they stuff modern capacitors inside mm -hmm. of a can, but it keeps the, the radio looking original. So I have a Collins KWM2A where the, the cans have dried out and I got the replacement can for it. it took a while. Yeah. So if you really want to restore something and I don't, you know, I'm, I'm a hacker. I want to bring it back to safe use. Um, you pay a little money and you can get the original looking parts. So, yeah. And, the other thing too, I do is like this radio has two prong and you can go either one way or the other on the socket yeah. and you can electrocute yourself. Especially well, the ones I was, about transformers. I was um, tempted to change the cord on that one. I picked out a cord even for it, a three wire, but that radio has a, a transformer isolation and the input capacitors are fine. And uh, it doesn't show any voltage either way. But if those capacitors fail, it can short to one side or the other, or if the transformer fa fails. Right. So if the three wire but I usually change these plugs to the modern one where the one is a little bit bigger than the other. And that way you can't get it wrong. Well, except plug it in. every once in a while, the electrician screws up. Yep. Then you're yeah. screwed. <laughs> but okay. the other one is to change it to a three prong. Yeah. So. Mike, you should probably mention there's a huge debate I know about. Some people who say, no, you should reform the capacitors. Oh, Other people should say, no, no, get rid of all of them. If, if you them. want to, to see that in action, this last video that I did called the Dream Receivers, uh, basically I reform the capacitor, turn the radio on, and you can, you can hear it's working, and it has a lot of hum. Okay, so it's a properly reformed capacitor, but it's not operating properly. So then I replace it with three new capacitors 
on the terminal strip and the hum goes away. So mm -hmm. reforming doesn't guarantee that you're going to get the best performance. It does maybe bring the capacitor back to a safe place, but it doesn't, it's not going to give you the filter action. I use a, a pipe cutter, you know, the ones that you spin with your hand to cut the cans open and then take all the gooky stuff out of it and put modern capacitors inside of it. And then you either could tape it back together or uh, sometimes people rivet it back together, but it keeps the radio authentic looking. Okay, thanks guys.